Um, as I was thinking about the best way of opening this up, I found myself wanting to talk about the Lyme community being a special community, that we are all in this together. And then it dawned on me, there may be either new individuals or those not familiar with Pennsylvania Lyme, and you may not really know our backstory, our, our origin, our mission, that sort of thing. So I'd like to use that as an opener to give you a backdrop of Lyme in Pennsylvania, um, how it created Pennsylvania Lyme, and what our mission is for you uh, on behalf of a family member here in Pennsylvania. A slide like this is no stranger to anyone with Lyme. You know it's bad. You know Pennsylvania's been the worst state for the last seven years. You know that it looks like a hockey stick in terms of the number of diagnosed cases by the CDC, and we far outdistance any other, every other state. So this backdrop of Lyme in Pennsylvania really became an origin story. Pennsylvania Lyme Resource Network was formed in 2012. We're a 501c3, we're an all volunteer organization, and our vision is to reduce the impact and future suffering of those with Lyme and tick-borne diseases. You can see all the areas that we are working towards, prevention education, early recognition, early diagnosis, easier access to care, training of doctors, uh, better treatment outcomes. The individuals that are the core members and volunteers of PA Lyme, this is really what we stand for. How we go about doing that is through many different approaches, outreach programs, awareness programs, education. Um, we fight for Lyme legislation, support and advocacy for your rights, for health practitioners' rights. We work with nonprofits, other public institutions, um, other um, you know, colleges of higher learning to work together on this whole dilemma uh, of Lyme. When, when you look at Lyme disease and you look at how prevalent it is in Pennsylvania, what becomes PA Lyme's DNA are the six bullets that you're looking at, fighting for legislation, medical conferences, patient conferences. We have a doctor referral program, DARE education prevention seminars and programs, and we have 18 community-based support group regions around the state of Pennsylvania. I thought there'd be value to just giving you a sense, what does each of that mean? This is the rally that we had the end of last year um, for House Bill 629. House Bill 629, as you probably know, was passed in the, in the State House, went over to the Senate. It is sitting in the Senate Banking and Insurance Committee prior to COVID-19. Senator Scavello, the chair of that committee, assured us that it was going to be put to a floor vote in the Senate Banking and Insurance Committee, which we believed it had a very good chance of passing. This rally here and everybody's support of it was instrumental in reaching out to congressmen, senators, House of Representatives to be very active to let them know that this is an important thing. Pennsylvania Line holds medical conferences every year. This is the 2020, which unfortunately was canceled. Here's why this is important. If you're in Pennsylvania, you want to get your family doctor to these conferences, two-day conferences. They're held in conjunction with ILADS, held in conjunction with Drexel University College of Medicine. We get the thought leaders in the Lyme research and science community to come in for training of local Pennsylvania doctors, nurses, health practitioners, um, LPNs, um, naturopathic doctors. The purpose of this conference is to fill the seats up with our Pennsylvania healthcare community so that they can be better informed for Lyme disease. Every other year we hold a patient conference. It sells out every year. We have about 100 to 120 seats every other year, 
and we do breakout sessions. We have certain tracks, different curriculum. We have different workshops. It is a full day of education and networking. It's a really appropriate venue to be in a room with individuals from your community, our Lyme community here in Pennsylvania, and we're all learning in the same up-to-date research and what's going on uh, in Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. Pennsylvania Lyme created a training division, Dare to be Tick Aware. It's a Lyme prevention program, preventing tick bites and tick-borne diseases. As you can see, it is really well vetted. We last year did approximately 140 sessions last year. There are a couple of dozen volunteer facilitators across the state and we hold this training workshop for high-risk groups, for outdoors people, uh, hiking, children, uh, people that are in sports, farmers. It could be for um, those employers that have employees that are working outdoor. It is so well received. The evaluations we get are through the roof, five star out of five star, that the information contained is definitely going to make a difference to that participant individually and to their family. What else Pennsylvania Lyme does is we have a doctor referral network, a Lyme literate healthcare practitioner. You can go to our website, you can go and email referral at PA Lyme, and you can say, I live in this area, here's my zip code, here's the county I'm in, who is Lyme literate in my area that I could go and talk to? You can see just by the chart there, we did 138 referrals last year. We have a dedicated full-time individual volunteer who talks and works with individuals who reach out to us to direct them to a Lyme literate healthcare practitioner. This is an informal network. The Lyme literate practitioners on our list have all agreed to be a part of the network and are all vetted uh, and they are considered by us, of course, to be Lyme literate. What really holds Pennsylvania Lyme together is our 18 support group regions. You can see on the map here, our 18 individual regions. You know, just visually, you can notice how, how really barren the Northwest of Pennsylvania is. We can go back five, six years ago, there were three regions. There was nothing in Pennsylvania except a loose network of individuals kind of running their own local region. This is the beauty of Pennsylvania line, banding together to network everyone so that we can really have the same kind of education message and support to the members of that community. Monthly meetings, we network with Lyme literate practitioners, we work with legislators in our area, and this really is the backbone. All of these individuals, of course, are volunteers. Before I shift gears, I want everyone to be aware, this year looks to be pretty bad. This is a quote from an email I got two, three days ago from a Lyme literate healthcare practitioner here in central Pennsylvania. And she said, I haven't seen this many tick bites in one week, 17 tick bites to her in one week. So the ticks are very, very plentiful this year. So please be careful when you go out there. It really segues nicely into ticklab.org. If you happen to get a tick attached to you, if you happen to dislodge a tick off of a child, yourself, a family member, you want to go to ticklab.org and you want to take advantage of their free testing service. They will test the tick for eight for Lyme, Borrelia, as well as 18 other co-infectors, and they have a 99.9% .9 success rate of diagnosing accurately for the PCR type of evidence-based um, diagnostic uh, system that they're using. So you can reach out. Look at the bottom right-hand corner. So to date, 16,000 ticks have been tested, infected 6,000. So we're looking at what is that? 40% of all ticks are carrying some kind of disease 
some kind of pathogen. It's really, really bad out there. So tick protection is a must. Um, this is a photo of a child near and dear to my heart. This is a child whose mother fully understands the devastation that Lyme can really bring onto an individual and onto a family. So if you're going to be out in the woods, really tick protection's a, a must. You can go to our website, palime.org, and there's um, just all sorts of information to talk about prevention. I will say one thing, of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania, the majority of people that were bitten by ticks last year, it was in their backyard. It was not hunting, hiking, it wasn't fishing, playing soccer at a municipal field, it was in their backyard. So protection's a must. I wanna bring this to really an ending to say that PA Line looks at our community as all of us together. We're connected, we represent you, we are you. We, our interests are united, our interests are vested. We could not do this without you. And we believe that you couldn't take the level of awareness in Pennsylvania individually without PA line. The reality of COVID-19 is we really could use your support. We're in, we're in a situation where um, we would be very appreciative of any donation that you would feel comfortable giving. Your support now financially of PA Lyme goes a long way. A lot of what I just showed and demonstrated is what we try to bring to support you and your family. So you can go to our website, you can go to our Facebook page, and if you're inclined, please do a dollar, a hundred dollars, whatever you have, it would make, it would make really a, a lot. So for that, we would be appreciative. Um, Bill, I'm wanting to go to the next. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. I want to introduce Julia Wagner. And is she on? Do you know? Um, no, actually, Eric, she's apologizing. She's having uh, internet connection problems and she doesn't believe she's going to be able to join us. And she apologizes to us and to everyone that okay. she can't uh, make it. I appreciate you telling me that. I, I was really hoping to do a soft introduction to Julia Wagner. We wouldn't be PA Lyme without Julia. She started Montgomery County Lyme. She started Lyme Action PA. She was appointed the Pennsylvania Governor's Act 83 Lyme Disease Task Force. Um, she testified to the U.S. Health and Human Services Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. It was largely through Julia Wagner's sole efforts and her tenacity uh, like Velcro that just attracted, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers, myself being one of them, you know, who's helping us on this virtual Lyme Impact Series is uh, William Moore. He's our director of IT. He runs the Pittsburgh Live Support Group. If it wasn't for Julia, you know, Bill and I wouldn't be together with everyone on this. So without her being able to introduce um, Dr. or Dr. Bersgano, what I want to do then is introduce Dr. Bersgano, just to say he has been a a fighter for the Lyme community for the last two decades. He's got two decades of experience and research in the field. He has appeared in virtually every form of media. He advises the CDC, the National Institute of Health, the U.S. Senate, the uh, United Services Joint Subcommittee. He's a founding member of ILADS, and he's just very, very, very active. Um, in our world, when we have an opportunity to really work closely with Lyme literate medical doctors, there is the upper echelon of those doctors that we just enjoy being with. I guess I could take that off and I'll let you see my face as I introduce um, Dr. Bersgano. It's really our privilege to have Dr. Bersgano. And with that, uh, Dr. B, um, allow me to kick it over to you. We 
you able to hear that, Dr. B? No, I just I was bounced off. Now I'm back on. Okay. I just gave you the best introduction known to man. So that's the introduction <laughs> you've never heard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Julia, Julia's not with us, so I was able to make the introduction. So please allow me to turn it over to you, and it's all yours. And thank you for uh, participating with us tonight. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to join. Let me get the uh, technology going here. Well, let's see. Sharing the screen. And opening it up. How does it look? Perfect. Yay! <laughs> well, everyone, thank you for um, signing into this um, little seminar. I'm very, very pleased to be able to do this. Um, I've always had a soft spot for Pennsylvania, and especially the Pennsylvania Lyme patients. They're such a great group, and they have such challenges that anything I can do to help, you know, I'm always happy to do that. Um, tonight, I wanted to talk about some new things. Um, You've heard my lectures, I'm sure, before about antibiotics and testing and all that. I don't want to go through the same rote, you know, program. I want to talk about some interesting new things, especially the impact of COVID on the Lyme and the Lyme patients. So we'll get started. Let's we'll see if the technology works. How do you like that? Works. All right. Four different sections. First, I want to talk about COVID and Lyme together. What we know, what we're finding, what we don't know, and some suggestions. Next section, I want to talk about the new Borrelia species and why I think it's very relevant for Pennsylvania patients. Third section is an update on disulfiram. If you haven't heard of disulfiram and Lyme, then you've been under a rock. <laughs> it seems to be the biggest and newest thing out there for persistent Lyme, biofilm Lyme, and so forth. And just wanted to give an update based on the recommendations from the practitioners who have used it the most and from patients too. And the last thing is an interesting thing I discovered about food foreign sensitivities, um, such as alpha-gal and so forth, and I, the connection to Lyme. So let's go through this. First section, what do we know about COVID and Lyme, and what should we know, what should we do? First of all, what is COVID? It's a disease caused by the coronavirus that's known as SARS-CoV-2. It's highly contagious, but as you know, not everybody gets sick. But the thing is, it's a two-part disease process, and this is key for understanding both the disease and how it interacts with Lyme. The first phase of it is like a bad flu. Flu-like symptoms, usually chest involved, can be GI. But initial phase is really the virus invading the body. That's often followed by a different phase, completely different. It's followed by what's called a hyperimmune phase. It's when the immune system gets like a runaway overreaction, we call it a cytokine storm. So it's at this phase is when it's the immune system that's doing the damage to the body more so than the virus. But this phase is also associated with blood clots in the blood vessels. Um, you've heard about strokes and um, blockages of arteries in the legs and the brain and the heart. Um, also, it will affect the blood's ability to carry oxygen. So you get decreased oxygen carrying capacity, which adds to the shortness of breath, even if the pneumonia is not that bad. So how do we test for it? Well, the nasal swab test, people have heard about that from the very beginning. It is a PCR, it looks for active infection, but it's really, really insensitive. Now, these are statistics from a recent study published in Annals, you know, major medical journal. Um, they one of infections when persons have been exposed. Nobody showed positive, 100% false negative rate. By day four, which is just the day before the symptoms were found to start, 67%, two thirds had a false negative. By the day the symptoms began, usually around day five, still 38% had a false negative rate. You're only picking up about a third less than a third. By the peak of the infection, when it's really the most, um, days eight and nine and so forth, you're still getting 20% false negative rate. And by day 21, the test gets back to being very insensitive. So the conclusion is, sounds like Lyme, if clinical suspicion is high, infection should not be ruled out on the basis of the PCR alone. So what about the antibody testing for Lyme? Um, just move over here. Okay. So an antibody test is a blood test that looks not for the, in the infection itself or the virus. It looks for antibodies. Um, it reflects prior exposure only and not active infection. Now, the key to understand here is that there was no such thing as a SARS-CoV-2 test. No such thing as a test for COVID until this whole thing hit. So none of the labs have had time to develop a test properly. 
None of them have been able to be reviewed by the FDA, nor have they been through any large scale clinical trials. Um, also, there's no gold standard against which they can be compared. So these are tests that have been very poorly performing. Um, and again, the quote is, they should not be used as a sole basis to diagnose or exclude SARS-CoV or to inform patients of infection status. Now, why is that? Turns out about half of our common colds are caused by a very mild form of a coronavirus. So the thinking is that if you make a very sensitive coronavirus antibody test, you're going to get a lot of cross-reactivity from people who've had the common cold in the past and get false positives. So what you do is you turn down the volume turn down the test sensitivity, but then you get a lot of false negatives. So it's this typical balance you get with serology. Um, the answer may be immunoblotting, which is the latest generation of serology tests, it uses to accommodate antigens and antibodies to, um, to separate out COVID-19 from the common coronaviruses. Um, if you do testing by antibodies, you know, again, you look for IgM and IgG, and was done was they took a group of patients who have, who have COVID and they're PCR positive. And by using immunoblots, they tested what happens in their serologies. It takes about a week after the symptom onset, which is already now two to three weeks after exposure, a week after symptom onset before you start to see IgM. It will persist for about six weeks, but it varies. Some have persistent for several weeks, actually several months. The IgG then appears one to two weeks later after the IgM. Now, we don't know the long-term outcome of antibody testing. Obviously, this is infection is new. But in other SARS infections, IgG lasted from six months to three years. Um, we don't know if COVID-19 will be any different. Also, what we don't know is if you have a positive antibody test, does that mean that you're immune? We don't have any idea about that at all. My personal feeling is that there must be some immunity. Otherwise, the hyperimmune serum taken from recovered patients would not benefit those who have COVID now. Um, I talked about immunoblotting. It has recombinant antigens, um, which are designed in the laboratory to be very specific. Um, a study was done on 33 PCR positive patients. 62 serial samples were done. They took the same group of patients and tested their blood two, three, in some cases, four times. They found the sensitivity about 90%, but more importantly, specificity is about 98%. In other words, it did not cross react with other viruses as far as they could see. This graph is interesting if you want to spend a minute. Um, it shows that, so to get my point to the work, there's a point. Um, it shows that by the time of symptoms, this is a dotted line going up and down here, um, usually the antibody titers, which are these graphs here, don't really go up at all. It's not until the first or second week afterwards that you see the rise. First, the IgM, which is this grayish wide dotted line. Then the IgG comes up. And there's this overlap period where you have them both. Eventually the IgM comes down, eventually goes away, but the IgG stays positive. So although you can't use antibody testing to diagnose active infection with COVID, what you can do is you can say, well, if the IgM is present, it's most likely that you have an early phase infection or an active infection. If IgM and IgG are present, you think about the infection really being still present and active. If it's only IgG and no IgM, the infection is probably not active. Now to go back to the pointer again, we have this blue oval that I'm going back and forth around. This is when the PCR shows positivity. Remember I said, you don't really see it until the beginning of symptoms and it seems to go away pretty quickly afterwards. Um, that's what these two peaks here show. So again, you're gonna have antibody response and that follows the positive PCR. So if you get a nasal swab that's positive, it's unlikely that you'll have a positive antibody test, maybe an IgM. If on the other hand, you have positive IgG, it's unlikely you have a positive PCR test. Now, does that mean a negative PCR that you don't have the virus? No, we know that the PCR is not very sensitive. So basically the state of the art is not very good with testing. I think a year from now, when the studies are, are more well worked out, we'll have a better idea of it. So right now, just like with Lyme, it's a clinical diagnosis and a clinical decision. So what about that? What about Lyme and COVID? How might a Lyme patient react to getting COVID? Lyme patients out there, of course, are very concerned as are their, their, their practicing physicians. Well, the truth is that timing is everything. I mean, that sounds like a cliche, but it actually is true here. 
It depends on the stage of Lyme and whether Lyme has affected the immune system and also the phase of COVID, whether it's the early viral phase or the later hyperimmune phase. Now let's, let's talk about the stages of Lyme. As you may know, Lyme infections can impair the immune system, it can affect all three major cell types of the immune system, the T cells, the B cells, and the killer cells, it can weaken them, it can make them work less well, it can actually kill them and decrease the counts. In my, in my experience, I see this effect at least six months and usually a year into the infection. So again, we're talking about the more established, if you want to call it chronic Lyme patient, that this is happening. On the other hand, if someone is co-infected, especially with Babesia, the onset of this immune impairment is earlier and it's much more severe. Um, that's just how it is with Babesia and Lyme. It, it makes the infection much more severe and harder to control. Now, it also turns out the Lyme infections also can activate the inflammatory cascade and make its own cytokine storm. Certainly not as severe as what you see with COVID, but it does happen. Um, with later and more active infections, this is more, uh, more severe. It's more severe when you're co-infected, again, especially Babesia, and also more severe during heart summer reactions, which is a clue to what you should do if you get COVID and you have Lyme disease. I'll talk about that in a second. Now, how do you know that Lyme has weakened the immune system? Well, the total white cell count could be low. The killer cell counts can be low. Um, and clinically, you have a persistent disease that's responding poorly to the meds that really should be working. Now, how about signs that Lyme, signs that Lyme has activated the cytokine? <laughs> it's everything. The malaise, the fatigue, the aches, the brain fog, the cognitive impairment, the neuropathy, the arthritis. Basically, the symptoms of Lyme come from the effect of the immune system not from the infection itself. So really, a chronic symptomatic Lyme patient, that's cytokines. So what happens when you mix the two together? Well, it's actually a paradox. Think about this. I bet you'll agree about this. Most patients who have active Lyme seem to never get the common cold. They seem to resist getting it. Um, and in fact, despite the evidence of immune impairment that I just talked about that's been documented since the 90s, there does not seem to be an increased susceptibility to other infections except of course the co-infections and maybe some DNA viruses. In other words, Lyme patients are not like the bubble boy has to avoid other people. They're gonna get every cold and every infection known to mankind. Somehow Lyme, despite the immune system being impaired, at least in the test tube, clinically they seem to not be having a problem. Now what about COVID? Does that same thing hold true? Well, I did a survey of many of my colleagues, Lyme literate doctors, and all of them support the finding that COVID is actually rare in Lyme patients, or at least the severe forms of COVID is very rare. Unfortunately, the usual risk factors for high risk or uh, more severe COVID still apply, advanced age, hypertension, and obvious immune deficiency, which I guess in the case of Lyme is when it's very advanced, late stage Lyme, then that would be an issue. And of course, if someone's on immune suppressive treatments, steroids and some anti-cancer drugs. But there's good news. First of all, most every Lyme patient is on some regimen of antibiotic, either medications or herbs to help control the Lyme. And many antibiotics used in Lyme are also antiviral. That includes the tetracyclines like doxycycline, minocycline, the macrolides and the macrolide family, which includes azithromycin, clarithromycin, and so forth, and the azoles, which is the tinidazole and, and uh, flagyl, uh, which is metronidazole. So it's interesting that these antibiotics themselves have antiviral qualities. And those of you who've heard about hydroxychloroquine plus Zithromax for COVID infections, it's because Zithromax is antiviral. Now, also most treatments for Babesia are also antiviral. All of them that are based on quinine and those that are based on Artemisia are antiviral. Plus the macrolides, again, that are used commonly like Mepron and Zithromax, again, the Zithromax is an antiviral type of drug. Are they strong antivirals? No, but they do seem to put a dent in it, especially if you're already on it when you get exposed. It's much easier to control the virus in the beginning of the infection rather than later on, just like a fly. Another interesting thing, most antifungals like, um, like fluconazole, that's an azole drug, they're also antiviral. And finally, many, many complementary treatments that a lot of Lyme patients are using um, are antiviral or, and or help the immune system. So there's reason to think that the low incidence of COVID infections or severe COVID infections in Lyme patients is due not only to this phenomenon of Lyme seeming to protect you from simple viruses, 
but also because a lot of the treatments are on already are seeming to help prevent it. So what are the suggestions? Number one, because Herxheimer's can produce cytokines, you wanna avoid Herxheimer if you're exposed to COVID. In other words, if you just started a, a treatment for Lyme or escalating the strength of the treatment um, and you're going through a Herxheimer reaction, but now you know you're exposed to COVID one way or another, you may want to back off on the Lyme treatment a bit to not let yourself have a bad Herxheimer. Most importantly for your self-support is to support the mitochondria. Mitochondria are vital for a healthy immune system. Um, all the chronic Lyme patients can use supplemental B12 despite even a normal NTHFR gene study because it's basically needed. Hydroxy B12 is the best. All the tricks that you can use and know about to help support mitochondrial function is something you should really focus on. We know that supplemental zinc is important because um, a lot of pe people who are chronically ill have a zinc deficiency and zinc deficiency is associated with a more severe COVID infection. Magnesium and N-acetylcysteine, which is NAC, all dampen the cytokine storm. Artemisia, as I mentioned before, is not only anti-inflammatory, it's also antiviral. Um, does it work for COVID? No hard studies to prove it one way or another, but the thinking is that it probably is. Transfer factors are available without prescription. Um, they are known to help um, kill cell function. Some of the mushrooms that are used for medicinal reasons are also found in studies to support kill cell function. So that's something that you may want to consider doing um, if you're at high risk and you have Lyme. Melatonin has been shown to decrease cytokine storm and many hospitals are prescribing that for their inpatients who are being treated for COVID. Likewise, vitamin C in high doses can help to um, not only be antiviral, but mitigate the cytokines as can alpha-lipoic acid. And both of these are also being prescribed in hospitals for inpatients. Now, what about the immune system? There are a lot of herbal anti-inflammatories you can get, such as quercetin, resveratrol, green tea, sulforaphane, and so forth. In fact, resveratrol are in many hospital regimens too. As many of you know from what I've talked about with Lyme over the years, um, it's when you sleep and rest that your immune system gets recharged. So enforced rest, getting adequate sleep, no matter what it takes to do it, even if it means a prescription drug, is very, very important when you have exposure to an infection. Likewise, fears and anxieties are known to be immunosuppressive, so things you can do to help yourself, counseling, meditation, exercise, eating ice cream, that's one of my favorites. All right, I finished my COVID part. I want to talk about some interesting findings about Borrelia that I think, I think um, explains something about Pennsylvania Lyme. It's always been my feeling and a lot of my colleagues agree that Lyme patients from Pennsylvania seem to be distinctive. Um, what does that mean? Well, Lyme patients from Pennsylvania, in my experience, have been more ill than the other Lyme patients I've seen. More sick, more difficult to treat, and it got to the point where I could tell a patient where they came from just by the symptom complex. They'd say, well, that's a Pennsylvania patient or that's a California patient. And but there's always a Pennsylvania patients that seem to be more sick, more difficult to treat. I don't know why that is, but I have an idea now that we've done some new studies. So important point number one, notice the yellow slide. Um, we think about Lyme disease, which is Borrelia burgdorferi. But it turns out there are a lot of different species of Borrelia infecting our patients. And maybe this is why Lyme patients from Pennsylvania are different. It could be that maybe there's a different blend of different type of Borrelia there. Um, I'll go through some of the data on this and hopefully that's an answer that's gonna help you in being evaluated and treated. So in the United States, we have two strains of Borrelia burgdorferi stricto, sensu stricto, but seven species of in other words, standard, if you want to call it American Lyme, um, there's two different strains that we know about and probably even more, um, but there are different species like Ephesalii and Duinii and others um, are also present. In addition to Lyme Borrelia, there's relapsing fever Borrelia. I say, what is that? Is another Borrelia? Well, I'm going to tell you all about it because it's really, really interesting. There are at least eight species of relapsing fever borrelia found in America. At least six have been found in humans in actual testing. So look at this list. Of the Lyme borrelia, we know that B31 and 297, and probably one called N40, are infecting American patients. Californiensis, 
Maonii, Avzelii, Garinii, and those are the European strains, but they are in America, especially because people have been traveling. Um, Spielmanii and Valenciana are also found in America, um, in American ticks, and in some cases, American patients. The relapsing Hefe Borrelia, the most famous one, too, I should say, are the Borrelia hermsii and Miyamoto. So Miyamoto has been in the news for a number of years, but that's actually not a live really. It's a relapsing fever boil. Now there are others. There's a thing called Tresica or tresica like It's not really sure what they should call this. There's one called Turricate, which was originally found in turtles, hence the name, but it's been isolated from patients. Hawkeye is especially prominent in the South of America, uh, for example, in Texas area. Lone Star Eye is um, Lone Star Tick Disease. There's another one that they don't know how to name it yet. They're calling it candidatus, which means it's a candidate. And they're thinking about calling Johnsonii. But there's a question whether Johnsonii is actually really one of the other ones, but they're not really sure. But the point is, look at all these different Borrelia. If you have a standard ELISA for Lyme, and in many cases, even PCRs, you're going to pick up Lyme Borrelia, not relapsing fever Borrelia. You're going to be picking up B31 mainly, which is what these tests were based upon. So all these others, you might have a chance of missing. Now, here's a map taken from one of the commercial labs where, in which they keep track of the Lyme cases based on counties. So all the green areas where the Lyme is, um, where they've detected Lyme in patients all across the country. Now, this is relapsing fever. Look at that. And I'll go backwards. They almost overlap, which is not a surprise. So they found it, or they've proven it in 49 states. The one state that's missing is New York, because at the time that the study was done, New York had not allowed any um, relapsing fever testing. They do now, but at the time they didn't. That's why it's, it's not there. But the point about this is, if you were to look up relapsing fever, you'd find that's a disease of people who are in the Rocky Mountains and in the far west, such as the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California, maybe in the desert southwest. But look at this map. Florida has it, Maine has it, all around the Great Lakes, um, and certainly in the Northeast, and a lot in Pennsylvania too. So it's something that cannot be ignored. So let me talk to you about some clinical series. When I saw this, it got me so impressed that this is why I started to lecture about this. They took blood testing from North American Lyme patients, came from one physician's practice who just happened to send in blood testing for Lyme. And the lab went ahead and in addition to the standard Lyme testing, used an immunoblot, which can tell you different species, just to see what's out there. And out of these 36, look what they found. 10 had Maonii, six had Spilmanii, six Californiensis, Two Garinii, two, uh, five, five Garinii, two Abzelii, one Valenciana, and only one B31. Five they found were Borrelia Lyme Borrelia. They couldn't really tell what species it was, which either means it was a different species or more likely it was a co-infection. So think about this. If you were to do a standard Lyme ELISA, which was based on B31, it detects B31, the chances are you might miss a lot of these other ones. And what is that? That's seronegative Lyme. So is seronegative Lyme really seronegative, or is it really that we're doing a test for the wrong species? Now, does this series show that only one out of 36 cases of Lyme is really classic North American Lyme and all the rest are not? Well, no, this is testing done at a commercial reference laboratory where people's blood is sent when no other test shows, so they do some fancy things. So this just reflects the seronegatives um, or people who are more likely to be a seronegative. Let me show you another one. There's a second series, again, 29 patients came from a different physician's office. And by doing these advanced tests, 11 Splomanii, six Californiensis, um, three Epsilonii, two Maonii, two um, Stricto, which is B31, um, 11 Sensolato, which means it's one of these, but it couldn't be speciated. Um, and four were Borrelia from Europe. They didn't know which exactly they were. And again, there's enough overlap that um, even though you can't speciate it, you know that it's really Lyme Borrelia. Now, again, if you did a standard Western blot or an ELISA, you would miss all these things, or at least the chances are that you would, because not many standard ELISAs based on lab string B31 will pick up these others. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but here's another one, another practitioner's office, 11 patients. Um, we had seven, four, one, and one of all these different species. Now, if you add them up, it comes out to more than 11. And the point about this slide is that you can be co-infected with different Borrelia. This one patient had Spilmanii and Maonii. Um, another one had Stricto plus Californiensis. And again, if you didn't do an advanced test, you would never know this. So the point is that standard Lyme serology is not detecting this. 
And maybe this is what we are now have been calling seronegative Lyme. I mean, I can't tell you how many patients of mine, a lot of them from Pennsylvania, you know, you see a band 41 or maybe a couple of things on a Western blot or melisa that was just below the cutoff and they were technically seronegative. But you know the had Lyme, they had the symptoms of Lyme, they just never showed up on a blood test. So we say, well, it's a crappy test or the immune system is faulty. Well, no, I guess we didn't know at the time we were testing for the wrong species. So what about relapsing fever? Same kind of thing happened. Um, 12 patients came in, um, were tested. Six had Turricate, five maybe Motoy, two Hermzii, and one was co-infected with two of them, Hermzii and Demi Motoy. Here's 48 cases, um, five Hermzii, eight Miyamotoi, seven Turricate, two Sucicolac, and 26 were unspeciated, which again, usually means a mixture of them because um, there's so many bands that show up in this immunoblock that they can't really separate them out. But again, it looks like so many different ones. I'll tell you why that's important when we get to testing. Another one, 35 patients. These were from Europe, Australia, as well as the United States. And again, the Hermesia, Sika, Tricate, Miyamoto, and Unspeciated. So what is this relapsing fever? Why am I making a point of it? Well, it's a good question. Nobody really can tell you exactly what it is because the definition is depending on how you're using it. In other words, are you defining it by its clinical presentation? Are you defining it by the tick vector, by the genetic analysis, by the serotype analysis? Um, people over the years have tried to um, characterize relapsing fevers by all these different things, and none of them really are that accurate. I'll go through it one by one. Clinical presentation. What is classic tick-borne relapsing fever? If you went to Wikipedia or a medical textbook, what would you find? I'll read this. Recurring febrile episodes will last about three days, and they're separated by afebrile periods of about seven days duration. Each febrile episode involves a crisis, and it really is a crisis. During the chill phase of the crisis, patients develop a very high fever, up to 106, believe it or not, may become delirious, agitated, tachycardic, and tachypneic, um, which means a high pulse rate, high respiratory rate, and it can last 10 minutes to 30 minutes, followed by a, a flush phase, it's like a crash. You get drenching sweats, a rapid decrease in body temperature, it may become transiently hypotensive, in other words, the blood pressure drops. Um, patients have even died during this phase. Um, patients who are not treated will experience several of these relapses again and again and again, and each one gets less and less severe over time. So after just several of them, it finally goes away. This is classic tick-borne relapsing fever. If someone came to you with this kind of a picture, you can never say that, oh, that's Lyme disease and mistaken it because you think it's a distinct illness, but not so fast. There was a study done where people's blood was sent into a lab because they thought the patients had Lyme disease. So these are people with Lyme symptoms, not what I just showed you, the classic relapsing fever things, the symptoms of Lyme. But of these 543 patients, 29% were positive not for Lyme, but for relapsing fever. But this study was only done on two different species, not the whole list of eight that I showed you earlier. So the numbers are probably conservative. If you separate out the California cohort, it was actually 38% had relapsing fever based on the antibody test. So these people did not have classic tick-borne relapsing fever. They presented like Lyme. So again, is this seronegative Lyme? Is this the atypical Lyme, the Pennsylvania Lyme that we've been seeing, the more strange cases? I was going to say weird, but that would not be polite. Um, also the point about this, um, classic relapsing fever is said to be something that you have these ups and downs of symptoms separated by a week or so. And then over time, it peters out and goes away. But there have been reports of chronic manifestations of um, relapsing fever, Borrelia, and chronic infections, including um, involvement of the heart and so forth. So there's a lot more overlap than what the textbooks will tell you. All right, so by clinical grounds, you really can't separate them out. Um, how about by the tick? Well, it's been said that relapsing fevers are transmitted by a tick called the Nithodorus, not an Exodes tick like Lyme, but a Nithodorus. Now check out this thing. I can't believe this animal. The tick lives for 10 to 20 years. Not one or two years, but 10 to 20 years. When they bite, they'll attach for five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe as much as a half an hour, but that's it. And then they drop off. So if you say, gee, you know, I was out in the woods and I came back to check myself, there's no tick on me. It doesn't mean you didn't get one of these to bite you. These ticks can feed multiple times. Um, there are people where in Africa, for example, where this is common or in the Southwest United States, if they happen to be in an area where these ticks are living, the tick can come and bite the person, 
go back and hide, come back and bite it again and again and again. So unlike the um, Ixodes ticks, where they'll bite the person once and go and molt over a period of months, this can actually bite you multiple times. Now, one of the relapsing fib uh, Borrelia tricate, it's maintained transoverally. What does that mean? It means if the tick is infected and then get, make, uh, gives off eggs, the eggs can be born infected. So even the larva can transmit infection. Now this is different from Lyme, but not so for relapsing fever. Also, these don't live in the grass. It's not like you go through the woods and you have to, you know, roll up your socks and put on um, repellents or rubber boots. They actually live in crevices, um, wood piles, um, wood and wall cracks, um, brick walls, for example, leaf litter, and also very importantly, nests for mammals. If you've ever had a mouse infestation in your house or in a cabin, that could be a place where these ticks have been hiding. And not just outdoors, but indoors too. And again, in some places, people have cabins in the woods, they've gotten infected from the ticks inside their house. And you don't find them because they go back into the crevice under the, uh, under the wood paneling. All right, so that is also another conundrum. They say, all right, it's a Nithodorus tick, but we know that Miyamotoi doesn't use a Nithodorus, it uses Ixodes, so it's the same tick that gives you a line. So that's one thing that, again, goes contrary to the um, dogma. Lonestarii is um, amblyoma, so that's another non-Amithodorus tick. And I've read studies in Spain where they found even Ixodes ticks have some of these relapsing fever burrow. Now look, look at the pictures. On the left, the Nithodorus. Now that looks pretty nasty and distinctive. You'd say, well, that's not a Lyme tick. But look what's on the right. If you take a Lyme tick in Ixodes and you have, let it get engorged, it really doesn't look that much different from the Nithodorus. You'd have to be a real tick expert, I think, anyway, to tell them apart once they're engorged. So maybe these ticks that we're saying, oh, it's Lyme, it's a Lyme tick, it's a Lyme tick bite, it's a Lyme infection, maybe not so fast. All right, so how about by genetics? Everybody's doing PCRs and uh, sequencing nowadays. Um, when you do sequencing, it's usually done on a specific gene. For example, the flagellin gene. But you can also sequence other genes and even the telomere of the genes. But the problem is when you come up with a family tree based on genetics, the family tree that you get looks different for different methods. So in other words, if you use a flagellin gene and make a, a tree, it looks different than if you use another part. So grouping these and defining them by where they fit on this tree is not very accurate. So even genetics can't really tell them apart that accurately. And then finally, serotyping. Years ago, before we had genetic testing, um, they would define relapsing fever germs by how they reacted on a serologic test. Um, but they found that every time there was one of these relapses, week to week a relapse, because the surface antigens changed, um, their serotype was different. Now, taking a step back, you know how in Lyme disease, um, the Lyme germs come and go like every four weeks is a four week cycle to Lyme. Um, and we know that every four weeks, a different set of genes, or I should say surface antigens get expressed because the genes become active or inactive. And that's why the immune system has a hard time keeping up. Well, it's the same exact thing here. Um, so when they were doing serologic tests on these and trying to group them by what antibodies were present in the blood or antigens present on the surface, Every time they take a test, even in the same patient, and wait a week or a month or two months later, they get a different one. It got to be so confusing that they stopped trying to name the different um, relapsing fever brilliant. They just called them the relapsing fevers with an S because they kind of gave up on it. So this whole long story to tell you about, it's a very complicated illness and it can be very easily mistaken for Lyme. Now look at these other very important things that Again, if you think that maybe some of what we're calling Lyme is really relapsing fever, it makes you start to think. In re relapsing fever, it's well recognized and accepted that it can be passed from mother to baby. Um, they've recognized spontaneous abortion, premature birth, neonatal death. It's not a controversy when it comes to relapsing fever, it is in Lyme. Why? Don't ask me, it's politics. Now, one of the relapsing fevers, the one that's carried by lice, um, has been shown to get to you not from a tick bite, but by going through the mucous membranes. In other words, if you scratch where the tick bit you and you touch your finger to your mouth or your eyes, the bacteria can go, the Borrelia can go into your body that way. Now that's kind of scary. People have wondered, can you get Lyme that way? Well, you know that some of the relapsing fevers you can, and maybe some of the Lyme you can too. Or maybe what you got that way 
really wasn't Lyme in the, in the first place. Maybe it was relapsing fever. The CDC has reported cases of really bad illness from these um, relapsing fevers, even a case of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is kind of what happens in COVID, not exactly, but similar to it. So it's not a benign illness by any means. Now think about the Inithodorus tick. Remember I said that the Borrelia go from one generation to the next because they carry through the eggs. Because they live for decades, these stupid ticks, and that stupid tick is a medical term, Think about it, it serves as its own reservoir. It doesn't have to bite an infected mouse to become infectious to humans. It's its own reservoir, okay? You can continue the line of infection from generation to generation, decade after decade. So that's really a different thing. So say, I'm gonna clean out the mice, I may not get rid of the ticks. Um, biologically speaking, they can do the same damage to our immune system by impairing complement, just like Lyme can do it. Another thing I found in the literature on the cardiogram, the thing called the QT interval, when it's, in, it's, when it's elongated, it puts you at risk for heart skips um, and even in some cases, sudden death. And that has been reported with this infection, not the sudden death, but the prolonged QT interval. Now, some medications will prolong that, and that's why it's very important to have a cardiogram done if you have Lyme disease, because you want to measure this interval. And now that we know that this Lyme-like infection caused by relapsing fever can actually affect this very important thing on your cardiogram, very important to have it checked. Now, another yellow slide. Important point number two, rapid transmission. Now again, we're talking about relapsing fever infections here. Here's a study, uh, what was it, uh, 2014. They found that it took only seconds to transmit this infection. b was transmitted within seconds of tick attachment. Now, you know, in line they say, oh, the dog maze has to be attached 24 hours, 36 hours. But people say, look, I was out in the woods and I might have been out there for a few hours or you know, even half a day. And I came back and I did a complete thorough tick check. I put my, you know, my clothing in the laundry and the dryers and I did a good scrubbing shower. There's no way it could have been on me you know, any longer than a few hours, if at all. Hey, if this was an Anithodorus tick, all it needed was 15 seconds. What they did was they took mice and they let the infected ticks bite the mice on the ear. And every 15 seconds, they biopsy the ear to see how long it took for the um, infection to spread through the skin of the ear. And guess what? At the first biopsy, 15 seconds, they got positives. So again, thinking that relapsing fever can mimic Lyme and probably has been confused between the two, maybe these early attachment or brief attachment infections might not be Lyme, maybe it's this. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you about testing for this because it is a big problem. Um, again, looking at the, um, the Wikipedias or looking at the medical textbooks, the classic relapsing fever is diagnosed by a blood smear. They look at the blood under the microscope and they see these squiggly Borrelia running around. Well, sure, but it only works in the acute stage of the crisis when the fever is going up to 100, 400, 506. Um, and if you see it, it's completely nonspecific. There's no way to prove that they're really Borrelia. So, you know, it could be something else um, in the blood. And, you know, if you miss it, it could be a false negative. So the blood smear is kind of, you know, low tech and not very useful and certainly not enough to make a diagnosis. So if you want to get a blood test, let's say you go to your commercial lab and you want to get a blood test for it, you can get a serology, but they only test for one species, Hermesii, none of the others. And very importantly, Relapsing fevers often have some Lyme type antigens. OSPC, out of surface protein C, which is a 21, 23 band, and band 41 can be found on these relapsing fever brill. So, how many times have you seen Lyme patients who have clinical Lyme, but their serology is, is either weak or negative, and the Western blot shows one band, 41? So, well, it's a bad Western blot or something wrong with the immune system. Hey, maybe it wasn't. Maybe this was a relapsing fever. That's all you can pick up. Well, how about Miyamotoi? You can get a blood test from Miyamotoi in the commercial labs, but they test it by using just one surface antigen. So if you think about, let's say, a Lyme disease Western blot, they can test for 10, 20 different surface antigens, and you have to have a number of them to show up before you call it positive. Here, that's just one surface antigen. It's like one band only. So sensitivity is very low, and the likelihood is going to be missing a lot of uh, Miyamotoi, if you base it on that. Now, large labs can do PCRs for Miyamotoi, but not for the other ones, um, not the Parker Eye or the other ones that I talked to you about. 
specialty labs, they can do PCR for genus, but not for species. But just like the smear, a PCR is only good in acute crises and in immunosuppressed when you expect a higher germ load in the bloodstream. So the only way to detect these other species is by the immunoblot that I talked about. Um, just like a Lyme immunoblot, it can detect multiple species of relevant relapsing fever Borrelia, but it will not cross-react. Otherwise, you can get an immunoblot for Lyme, an immunoblot for relapsing fever, and they don't cross-react with each other. Now, my bet is that if you start to do this test more frequently, you'll be seeing a lot of so-called seronegative Lyme patients really don't have Lyme at all. They have the relapsing fever. Another yellow slide, important point number three. Um, IgM, we've always heard that a positive IgM is um, something you should ignore in late Lyme because it could be okay in early Lyme, but once you get into late Lyme, if it's a positive IgM, um, then it's probably a false positive. Well, here's a, a proficiency series done um, on the more modern Western blots and immunoblots blots that we have nowadays available. And this is a proficiency series. Let me use my pointer again. Right, on the far left, CDC set one, these are early Lyme disease. Set two is later Lyme disease. Proficiency testing is from the state. This panels of autoimmune disease, viruses, syphilis, and so forth. Um, this percent specificity for IgM, Western blot, even in late Lyme disease is 100%. Overall, if you exclude a few viral infections and so forth, in the worst case, it's 94.7%. And in the better cases, using CDC criteria, up to 100%, both on immunoblots and the Western blots. So by using the more modern testing, a positive IgM, even in late disease, is significant, okay? Because it's specific for this. You know, a couple of false positives here and there, like with syphilis, for example. Um, but, you know, if you have a sensitivity of 95% or better, you know, that sort of negates that argument that a positive IgM latent disease doesn't count. Nowadays, it does if you're using one of the better tests. Another important point, um, if again, using an immunoblot, which is a different technology, it will pick up early Lyme disease. Now, this is a whole thing. Again, we've heard the dogma that you can't use a serology if someone comes in with a rash because it's a stupid thing to do. It's a waste of time, waste of money, waste of blood because you don't have a positive test um, at the time of the rash. Well, let's go through the slide here, get my pointer going. All right, we'll start at the left, the early acute stage. This is samples from CDC. Standard um, two-tier test, 20% of the time you get a positive IgM, 80% of the time a false negative. IgG shows nothing. However, with an immunoblot, look at this. Two-thirds of the time, you will get a positive IgM. About half the time, a little less than half, you get a positive IgG. Now, is that screwy? What does that mean? Well, it's not that you don't have IgG by the time of the rash, it's mean that the testing had not been sensitive enough to pick it up. So if you have either positive IgM or positive IgG on an early Lyme, you're going to pick up 93% of the cases. So now you think about it, whether specificity of at least 95%, if you're now picking up 93% uh, by using a more modern test, that makes it really, really useful. First of all, it changes the dogma that you can't test for early Lyme. Number two, if you have someone come in with an atypical rash, which most of them are, or summer flu without a rash, now you have a way of testing to see is it really Lyme or not. Um, the statistics for the, this type of a test in relapsing fever is almost as good. It's not 93%, it's more like 80%, but still we now have a test for early Lyme. So it's my next, my important point number four. So this series, I wanna make some conclusions. First of all, there are a lot more Borrelia out there than we realize. Um, the relapsing fever Borrelia often mimics Lyme, and the flip side is that Lyme can mimic the relapsing fever. So all of you and all of us need to learn about relapsing fever and consider it when we're making a diagnosis of a Lyme patient, um, especially if someone's seronegative. Now, if Lyme is suspected, obviously you want to test now for all the different Borrelia, the Lyme and the relapsing fever Borrelia and all the different species. The conclusion is also that seronegativity may not reflect a bad test, but that you've been testing for the wrong species. We know with relapsing fever, rapid transmission is accepted. It's been published. Transplacental passage is accepted. It's published. Um, no controversy or argument there. And in early Lyme, we now have a test that can be useful and a positive IgM is significant. All right, section two. We're gonna go to disulfiram, clinical update. Actually, it's section three, I haven't changed the slide, sorry. 
Disulfiram. What is disulfiram? Disulfiram is a drug clinically or commercially sold as antabuse. Um, it's been used to prevent alcoholics or to deter alcoholics from drinking because if you have alcohol, when you have antabuse in your system, it makes you terribly sick. Piercing headaches, nausea, body aches, horrible. Um, and turns out, interestingly enough, that this drug, generic name is disulfiram, has been found in the test tube as well as in studies to actually be an antibiotic. It's been able to eradicate staph, strep, enterococcus, bacillus, listeria, even tularemia and mycobacteria, which is the germs of tuberculosis. Um, not just bacteria, they found it works against parasites such as Giardia and Entamoeba. It's been anti, found to be antiviral. In fact, it included a study recently that it can have a, an inhibitory effect on the COVID virus. It can also inhibit some fungi with some antifungal properties. I learned about this illness called pythiosis. Never heard of that before. It's this really terrible infectious disease caused by a germ. It's like a fungus, but it's kind of a, a blend between a fungus and a, and a, and a parasite. And there's absolutely no known cure until now. And people who have this, let's say they get an infection in their leg, the only treatment for it was to amputate the leg. Can you believe that? Um, but they found this drug works. How do you like that? Now, as an antimicrobial, it does other things. It inhibits beta-lactamases. In other words, cell wall drugs that kill germs by, um, by inhibiting beta-lactam, um, this works to make those drugs work better. So it makes penicillin work against penicillinase containing germs like Borrelia. It's also an efflux inhibitor. Many antimicrobials, for example, the tetracyclines, the macrolides, they get into this system, but the efflux pump pumps them right out again, so they don't get to do their thing. But this inhibits that efflux pump. And the last thing that's really important, which is probably the most important of all, is that they found that this busts biofilms. Now, everyone's been talking about biofilm busting ever since Evo Sapi showed that Rally make biofilms. Um, you know, people are using enzyme treatments and all sorts of different herbs to try and bust the biofilms. And while they do work in the test tube, I really have my doubts how much of that herb is going to intactly get through your GI tract, through your micro, the GI barrier, into the lymph, into the blood, through the liver, and out, come out the other side and find a biofilm. At that point, it probably is not active anymore. But this stuff is. Okay, now let's go through the studies. How does it work? Well, it forms it, what's called a disulfide. Um, if you have a compound in the bacteria that contains sulfur, this will bind two of them together and kind of stick them together and stop whatever that enzyme is or metabolite from working. So these bacterial cofactors, enzymes, metabolites, if they contain thiols, which is sulfur containing, it, this disulfur will inhibit it. Interestingly, this is how garlic works. High dose garlic, the active ingredient is allicin, and it does the same exact thing. I know in Asian medicine, um, IV garlic is given for syphilis and it's actually being used for Lyme disease. Um, it works, but people don't like it because they smell terrible. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, people who take that sulfur, they start to smell like garlic too. It's from the sulfur in it. So that's one interesting thing. Another interesting thing, in people who take antibuse because of alcohol avoidance, if they take alcohol, um, they get terribly sick because we have a thing called aldehyde dehydrogenase um, that the antibuse inhibits. And when it does that, you get these aldehydes in your bloodstream, which are these toxic organic chemicals that make you horribly sick. Well, it turns out bacteria also have this and the antibuse-like effect must make the bacteria sick too. It's just a theory, but we know that these enzymes are present. Now, another interesting thing to know, disulfiram is an active compound. It doesn't work against the germ as it is. But once it passes through your metabolism, it breaks down into what are called um, metabolites. In other words, the initial compound breaks down to other compounds, but they too are active against the infection. The difference is that the parent compound will be in your bloodstream only for a matter of minutes to an hour or so. By the time then, it breaks down to these other components. So the original compound is gone. But then the other compounds are there, but they stick around for a long time. They can stay there for days and even weeks. So the important point here is that some bacteria respond only to the parent compound, which has a very short half-life, while others respond to the metabolites in the parent too, long half-life. Turns out luckily for us, Lyme responds to the metabolites as well as the parent compounds. So we don't have to worry about taking 
that I saw from very frequent. Now, how did this whole Lyme thing come about? Well, a study was done on the Borrelia persisters, and they found that the sulfur will kill Borrelia in the log phase, the growth phase, in the stationary phase, which is a persister phase, and even those in biofilms. Remember, it said it's a biofilm buster. Now, look at this mouse study made by hair stand up. They said sulfur eliminated Borrelia completely from the hearts and bladder by day 28. The treated mice showed lower total antibody titers by day 21. And by day 28, the total IgG2 was gone. Now, you know, we've treated people for Lyme for years now with different antibiotic regimens, IV, orals, combinations, different things. And, you know, if they're positive antibody, if they have a positive antibody test, we don't see the antibodies go away by day 28. I mean, these antibodies stay because it takes a long time for them to clear, but also because of the germ is still there and your body's still reacting to it. But here, by 21 days, the, the titers go down, and by 28 days, they found it was gone in these mice. Of course, mice are not humans, but this has never been seen before with any other antibiotic in mice. And the last point is really amazing. The treated mice showed a reduced expression of inflammatory markers and protected against histopathology and organ damage. I mean, we don't ever have a Lyme treatment that protects you from organ damage. You know, you get damage to the knee or to the heart or the nerves. We've never had an antibiotic make that stop. You know, with damage is damage, it's done. But here, it prevents the damage from happening in the first place. Now, this whole thing came about because Dr. Ken Ligner um, published a case report of three treatment-resistant patients who had Lyme and co-infection with Babesia. And as you know, that's like the worst combination. With several months of treatment, they were cured. Now, we never use the C word in Lyme because we don't like to say you're cured. We say it's controlled. We never know you can really cure Lyme disease. These patients apparently were cured. Let's talk about this. His first patient was on triple antibiotic treatment for eight years for Lyme and Babesia. He could not stop the treatment without suffering a relapse. He took the disulfum for four months and it all went away. He's now been off treatment for, at this point, three years, feeling better than ever. In fact, when he was on the eight years of combination antibiotics, he said, I'm fine, I'm fine. But when he finally got completely over it, he realized he wasn't completely fine, that he really was sick and didn't know it. He was just like living with it and sort of accepted that as a new normal. But when he finally got over it, he really came back to what really was normal for him. So like it can, in the test tube work against other parasites that apparently targets Babesia as well as Lyme. And what about Bartonella? We don't see a lasting effect on Bartonella itself, but Bartonella is a very powerful creator of biofilms. And if this is a biofilm buster, it seems to allow Bartonella medications to get to the Bartonella finally. And I've had patients who have Bartonella treatment going, it doesn't really get them anywhere until they get on disulfiram for Lyme, Babesia, and now the Bartonella drugs are starting to work. So, Again, it's not anti bartonella but it is helpful for the, uh, the biofilm. So what do you do about it? First, if you're gonna take it, I recommend you clean out the yeast from your intestinal tract. Why is that? Carbohydrates in our food will be fermented by yeast into alcohols. And the results is get an antibuse-like reaction, especially after eating high carbohydrate foods. So before you begin disulfiram, you really have to go on an anti-yeast regimen, low carbohydrate diet, might have to be treated for yeast with some anti-yeast medications. Likewise, once you're on the treatment, you have to stay in the low carbohydrate diet, and maybe take nystatin with your meals. Um, nystatin is a drug that is complementary with this disulfiram, but drugs like fluconazole, diflucan, you cannot take with it because they add up to causing liver toxicity. So any kind of anti-yeast treatment has to be before you start the disulfiram, or then if you're going to be treated during disulfiram, you can't use these azole drugs. And likewise, alcohol is out, but a lot of the supplements people take, especially the liquid supplements, are based on an alcohol solution. So you have to be sure that you be careful about that. Now, dosing it is very important because it's so powerful. People went on, just took a pill. They had terrible heart signs. They thought they really were having some kind of drug side effect. So what's been learned over the years is that you have to start with a very tiny dose and only slowly over time can you increase it. I'm giving you an example. This is not dogma. This is not for everybody. Of course, you talk to your physician, but a simple example is you take a quarter of a 250 milligram pill, 62 and a half milligrams, once every third day, and maybe two to four weeks later, you, up, you have an option to make it every other day, maybe every day. Now, the important point of this is that you don't want to have the so-called cytokine storm that the Herxheimer reaction causes because it can be really, really severe with this drug. My concern, though, is that on the other hand, this is how you get drug resistance, especially with the bees who are having a low dose. So you have to balance 
Herxheimer with, um, you know, with worry about resistance. So you have to push the dose, but not so hard that you get sick. The ultimate final dose is based on body weight and tolerance, anywhere from 250 to 500 milligram a day. And my advice is choose the lowest one that works. But there are some people who are very sensitive to this. And even on a 62 milligram pill or dose, they're having good effect from it. They don't really have to raise it up. It depends on how the metabolism handles the drug. Um, because this has a short half-life parent and a long half-life um, metabolite, you want to get benefit from both. So when you get to daily dosing, it's good to try and break the pill into small pieces or break the dose into several different parts. They so have three or four doses a day and taken with food to spread out the effect. And some physicians are recommending compounded drugs that or compounded disulfiram because you can get exactly the dose you want. They can get enterocoded so it has a more gentle or more prolonged, slower absorption. So you have a longer half-life. Uh, but it's not really required because like I said, Lyme germs are sensitive to the metabolites which have a long half-life. It's recommended that because of the Herxheimer's, you stop other antibiotics before you start the disulfiram, just to not confuse the thing. And because the main side effect to watch for is liver enzyme abnormalities. In the beginning, most doctors will do a liver enzyme test every couple of weeks. And if it stays stable over a period of time, you can make it less often, maybe every month. Um, this is my version of precision medicine. This is how we take a disulfiram pill and make a smaller dose. All right. Supportive therapy. You want to prevent Herx reactions if you can. Have the usual things: vitamin C, nicotinamide, selenium, NAC, all the usual things you do for uh, binders and so forth. Um, you can treat the Herxheimer reaction that way with the binders, anti-inflammatories, detox regimens, all the different things you've learned from Lyme disease. But it really is important here because the Herxheimer's can be strong. Likewise, supportive things during treatment: aflipoic, curcuma, and so forth. Um, even vitamin D. Fish oil and CBD, very important for inflammation control. If you happen to get exposed to alcohol or have carbs and you start getting an anti-abuse reaction, it's been said that vitamin C and zinc lozenges um, can help abort that. I'm not so sure that's true, but that's something you can try. If it's diet related, it, an extra dose of myostatin sometimes will help. As the recovery advances, you can start to support the mitochondria. I don't like you to support mitochondria very much in the beginning because that also supports the infection to some degree, but as you start to improve and you know the treatment is working, you can start to uh, get the mitochondrial support going. This is another very important point. It turns out that glutathione, if it's given in a high dose, will inhibit the conversion of disulfiram into the active metabolites. And because it's these active metabolites that kill the Lyme germ, you really don't want to have a high dose glutathione. If you're taking NAC to boost the glutathione, Okay, because you're still talking about normal amounts in your bloodstream or getting to normal amounts if it's been low. But high, high dose glutathione like IV um, may make you feel better at the time, but at the same time, it may inhibit the activity of disulfiram. So that's just a precautionary tale. Now, what about toxicity? Um, again, it's related not just to the dose, but also the rate of escalation of the dose, as well as how long you're on it. Um, again, avoid aggressive dosing, start gently, and don't have to push to some arbitrary amount. You go to the dose that works for you. The liver enzyme problem is rare, and it's idiosyncratic, which means it's not like if you take this many milligrams, you're okay, and a little bit more, you're going to get it. It's one of these almost allergic kind of reactions that is rare, one in 15,000, um, and can't be predicted ahead of time, which is why you have to monitor the enzymes. From the nervous system point of view, you can get a neuropathy from it, a peripheral neuropathy that can make you get confused with Lyme, but I'll tell you about how to tell them apart because it's not always the same. Another important thing, it inhibits an enzyme in our brain called dopamine beta hydroxylase. That's what converts dopamine to norepinephrine. So what happens is you have more dopamine built up and a deficiency of norepinephrine. And this is especially if you raise the dose quickly. You raise the dose slowly, your body adapts. High dopamine can give you encephalopathy, you know, confusion, agitation, even mania where you can't stop talking and you're all excited. Um, lower epinephrine can lead to depression and fatigue. Um, so that's something to watch for and also another reason to not push the dose quickly. Long-term in cell and animal studies have been no evidence for cancer causing, which are teratogenic, mutagenic, carcinogenic effects, no effects on, on the fetuses. And even pregnancy is category C, which means it's not a terrible drug. I guess you want to avoid it, but it's not something that's absolutely terrible. Another important thing to know about, the enzymes in green tea, the EGCG, 
Um, if you take it concurrently with disulfiram, it can add to the liver toxicity. So we recommend you don't take green tea supplements while you're on disulfiram. Another very important point to notice. A lot of supplements that are like general support supplements for the mitochondria, for the immune system, they contain green tea as a supplement. So look on the label, make sure you don't have any of that if you're going to go on disulfiram. All right, so what about the neuropathy? So it's been described in alcoholic and cocaine addicts um, who are treated long-term with at least 500 milligrams a day. And when doses lower than that's seen only rarely. But now think about these people. It could be multifactorial that they have neuropathy. They've been on other drugs, alcohol itself, poor nutrition. As I said, the instance is low, it's one in 15,000. But the thing is that the reaction, the neuropathy can occur later on in treatment or even after treatment ends because it's a delayed reaction. It can be a sensory neuropathy with the tingles or the numbness. It can be a motor neuropathy where there's a weakness. It could be both. Um, and it usually reverses after drug withdrawal. And the more sick patients who are really bad alcoholics, some lingering damage has been there. I've surveyed my colleagues and so far, they've really not seen it in Lyme, but they're not really sure because there is some overlap with clinical Lyme neuropathy. But here's the trick. The neuropathy from disulfiram is what's called glove and stocking. It starts in the periphery, like at the fingertips, and works its way up closer and closer to the body as time goes on. Likewise, it might start in the toes, spread to the foot, and to the ankle. And it's like a very symmetric, progressive, obvious type of thing. On the other hand, the neuropathy from Lyme, as most of you probably know, it's patchy. It can be you know, on your side. It could be on your knee. It could be on your foot. It could be on your ear. It could be on your face. And it can migrate. It could be in one spot for a while, then go to another spot. So if you have the patchy migratory kind, it's more likely Lyme. And if it's a glove and stocking and symmetric and fixed and ass sanding as they call it, then you can think that's more like disulfiram. And the neurologist can always do a nerve test and see if what the thing is, what differentiate the two. Other side effects, as I said, it can affect the um, enzymes in the brain and the catecholamine. So you can get drowsy, depressed and low libido. Uh, because of the high, higher dopamine, um, agitation, mood changes, uh, and this is dose dependent and escalation rate dependent. Um, it also can affect your autonomics, giving you an autonomic imbalance. It's not a neuropathy, it's an imbalance because of this change in, in brain enzymes. Now, the other thing is that the sulfuram, as it's metabolized through your liver, it depends on the cytochrome, what are called the P450. A lot of other medications, prescription drugs, and even some botanicals can affect these enzymes. Um, the important point is that you need this for P450 to get the active metabolites. So you don't want to have something that's going to inhibit the action of that. But on the other hand, the disulfiram will itself affect the P450 and slow down how it works for other drugs. So example, if you take a benzodiazepine, a drug like Valium, when you're on disulfiram, the Valium is going to stick around there almost twice as long because it doesn't have the ability to clear out of the system as, as easily. And we're gonna finish by saying a few things about informed consent. Informed consent is not just a document that you sign with the doctor and don't read it. It's not a document, it's information, okay? The information that you should get is not written on a piece of paper, it's a discussion you have with the doctor. It's like, how do you take it? Um, what to take with it, what not to take with it, what possible side effects to look for, what to do if you get them, when to call. And you know now that you need to have regular blood tests, at least in the beginning, so get an idea of what you need to do about that. Last section, I know we're running low on time, so I'll go quickly. Alpha-gal and breaking tolerance, they like that. What is alpha-gal? Alpha-gal sensitivity has been reported after bites from Lone Star Tick. Alpha-gal is a carbohydrate that's present in the blood of most mammals. And the thinking is that when the tick bites, let's say a deer or a mouse, some of that alpha-gal gets into the tick. Then when the tick bites the human, that alpha-gal gets into the human and sensitizes the person um, so that anytime they get exposed to meat from a mammal, if you eat like red meat, you suddenly get this terrible allergic reaction. Um, so you can't tolerate these red meats anymore. And the only meat you can tolerate, the only protein source are fish um, and poultry. They don't have alpha-gal. And the only other mammal that doesn't have it are primates like us. And not going to eat monkeys, hopefully. So this is something that's been recognized, but not so fast. This whole theory about how to get alpha-gal may not be correct, okay? Turns out our own gut flora make alpha-gal. So how come everybody doesn't have this? Lyme Borrelia, Bieberdorfer also makes alpha-gal, okay? That's been said that you get this from the bite of a lone star tick, all right? 
why only a lone star? Other ticks bite mice and deer, so why just a lone star? Something doesn't, you know, doesn't compute there. Now you can get alpha gal sensitivity to some exodus bites, but really the main guy is a lone star tick. Now, another thing is some people can't tolerate dairy. Well, that's weird, there's no alpha gal in dairy, even though it comes from a cow, there's no alpha gal in that, why would that be a problem? Another thing that's interesting, a lot of Lyme patients have a new onset of food sensitivities that came on once they got Lyme disease. They suddenly can't tolerate wheat or soy or dairy. They get these food allergies. So what I found was a study in the dog. This is really interesting. It turns out that having the alpha-gal in their intestinal tract from the normal gut flora, your body does develop antibodies to it. But the, the antibodies that you expect to have if there are germs in your system, like IgM and IgG, they're not the kind of antibodies that induce an allergy. Those are IgG. So somehow your body's immune system, it's a system called tolerance. You can tolerate your gut flora because you don't get this allergic antibody to it. But when the tick bites, suddenly the IgE develops. So the suggestion is it's not that you've got alpha-gal from the tick because you already have it in you anyway. It's that something in the tick bite, in the saliva, changes your immune system and prevents this from happening. It breaks, it's called breaking the tolerance and it triggers the reaction of the, of the allergy. So the new mechanism that's proposed is that it's not due to getting a dose of alpha-gal from the tick bite, from a factor, but it's from a factor in the saliva that breaks our tolerance to the alpha-gal. Now, I personally speculate, and there's no study, it's just my thinking, that this may also explain why we see so many food sensitivities and food allergies after the tick bite, somehow affecting our immune system. Um, there's probably an imbalance between the two different regulatory arms of the immune system, the thing called Th17 and the T regulatory cells, because um, the Th17 is what fights germs, but it's also what induces autoimmunity um, and the reaction against our food in the alpha-gal. So the question is, all right, you've got this, how do we fix it? Well, the loss of tolerance, and this comes quotes from articles, um, autoreactive lymphocytes are the lymphocytes in our immune system that react against us, like cause autoimmune symptoms, the neuropathy of the arthritis and the food sensitivity. They're normally silenced by this tolerance, but this tolerance can be negated and this um, reactive lymphocytes can be awakened from infectious organisms in a milieu rich in danger signals. Now if that doesn't describe Lyme, I don't know what does. And once the autoimmune attack has been initiated, the persistence of antigens and the fact that the T cells feed on each other, they conspire to fuel a self-sustaining vicious cycle that maintains lifelong disease. So I'm thinking even one step further, that this is probably not only why you get food sensitivities in Lyme, why so many Lyme patients have um, molecular mimicry, why they're getting neuropathies and arthritis from Lyme, because this tick salivary factor has changed the balance of our immune system. Now, this loss of tolerance is something known about for a long time. And this is a slide I don't expect you even be able to read and even want you to read, just to show that in many, many, many people in many different institutions trying all different therapies, including gene transfers, nanomedicine, and everything to try and figure this out. So what can we do until this whole gets figured out? First, remove as many co-stimulatory antigens as possible. In other words, get rid of the Borrelia, the co-infections, and so forth. Um, now we have disulfiram, maybe you can do that. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. My own daughter, who had Lyme for a long time, developed terrible gluten intolerance. Um, so I treated her and treated and treated for the Lyme. I finally got her on a good regimen and she got completely well. I'm knocking out when I say that. And when she did, all her gluten intolerance went away. And I never heard of that before, but she's a perfect example. And since then I have heard of it again. And now this explains it, I think it explains it. So first is get rid of as many infections as you can, other called stimulatory antigens. Then you restore gut microbial balance with the prebiotics and probiotics, getting rid of yeast and fungi, getting rid of parasites and avoid the trigger food so you don't keep fueling the fire and turn down the volume. Here's again where you wanna support the mitochondria because the mitochondria support the immune system. And this T cell balance, the T regulatory cells, the TH17s, you try and restore the balance once you've gotten on antimicrobial treatment. And why I say that afterwards is because this TH17 is bad and good. It's bad because it mediates autoimmunity, but it's good because it fights the infection. So once you've got the infection, under treatment, then it can start to use things that restores the balance. And what we know are transfer factors, which have been support, uh, supported by clinical studies, and also the anti-inflammatory regimens, whether they be prescription or herbal, 
those things can be used with success um, a lot of the time. I'm getting to the end. Final recommendations. First of all, keep current. I've showed you some examples of how new testing has actually opened our eyes. So if you're gonna do testing, look for what's new, but don't go for the crazy new thing that's been out there just a week. Um, look for well-proven methods that have data behind them, good proficiency results that you can actually get the company to tell you about. Otherwise, I would be kind of skeptical. When you have treatments, be open-minded, but always try and learn the underlying mechanisms to see if the treatments make sense to you. I mean, you know, you don't want to go to some witchcraft person and get like, you know, I have Newton, whatever, and see if it's going to treat you and cure you. But say, right, what is wrong with me? Or what are the possible things that could help? So, you know, as you found out long ago, you have to be your own advocate. Along those lines, you want to keep a daily diary because you want to spot trends and things that change to help you figure out things that are working, things that are not working. Keep a timeline. Very important is to share and publish your results. If Dr. Ligman never reported the study in three patients, all of this news about disulfiram would never have been out there. So if it was just three patients, it started a revolution in Lyme treatment. And I really recommend that you get with your doctors, your caregivers. If you have something interesting to report, you should report it. And finally, note informed consent is it's not a piece of paper you sign. It's being educated about what to look for, what to be aware of, what to do, what to not do. And that, my friends, is the end of the seminar. So I'm sorry I went long. I'm sorry I spoke in my quick New York fashion, but I did have all these interesting things I wanted to share with you. Um, and I think if we're gonna have time for some questions, we will start them now. Is that true, you guys? Yes, I believe uh, even though we're um, a minute past here, I'd say let's take at least five, five, at least five minutes for some question and answers. Um, we have a few people that have asked questions. Uh, if anybody has a question, I can't promise you that I'll get to it, but if you would uh, leave a question in the Q&A in Zoom, or if you have a question that you would want to post to the comments of the live stream in Facebook, uh, we will try to entertain those. Uh, so Dr. Berescano, uh, the questions I have so far, while you were in the section of your presentation, New Brilliant, uh, New Paradigms, somebody asked, you had a lot of studies in that section, somebody asked, if those studies that you quoted were uh, available online somewhere that they could be sourced. Yeah, some of them are published and um, I can send a link to the Pennsylvania guys and, um, and they can share it with you, that'd be fine. Okay, I'll very make, good. I'll make a note to myself right now. <laughs> very good. Um, the next question is about uh, bringing of the ears. Is, have you found in treating Lyme patients that uh, ringing of the ears is a common symptom in, uh, in Lyme disease? And if so, do you have any suggestions on treatment of that particular symptom? Well, ringing of the ears is, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's common in Lyme disease and there are two different things that can cause it. One is the Lyme itself because it is a form of, if you think about it, nerve damage, um, just like any other neuropathy and treating the Lyme and supporting the nervous system and its healing can help with that. It also can be a side effect of certain antibiotics. Um, drugs like the macrolides, like azithromycin, clarithromycin, which is vaccine, azithromax can cause that as a side effect. Gentamicin, which is not used much in Lyme, but is used in Bartonella, can do that. Um, and there are others too. So it can be from medication, it can be from the Lyme itself. And the treatment for that is to do anything you know of to support the neuropathy, to heal the neuropathy. First of all, get rid of the Lyme if that's causing it. If you can, I mean, treat that. And in terms of supporting the uh, nervous system, there are a lot of supplements you can use that I had listed in the seminar that, that can be helpful. So yep, a lot of things you can do. Very good. Um, I have a question on uh, dosing of disulfiram. You, you had mentioned that uh, to use the lowest effective dose. So the question is, how do you know, uh, I mean, someone can figure out what dose they tolerate, but what are the clues to know if it's effective or not? Well, typically when the dose is begun, there's a Herxheimer reaction and the dose is kept at whatever that initial starting level is for a week or two or three. And as things settle down, then you inch up the dose and likely you have another Herxheimer when that settles down, you inch up the dose. And you'll get to a point where as you raise the dose, you stop having new Herxheimers. So if at that point you stay in that level and you're improving over time, then that's a reasonable dose. If you find that you're on a plateau and not improving, then you can try inching it up again. 
Um, but I don't find any um, good reason unless you're very large body size and weight to go above 500 milligrams. And a lot of people in my experience do well at just 250. A similar question, uh, you had mentioned starting out slow. Uh, someone is asking, they'd heard that uh, some people might start out as low as 10 milligrams. Is the, have, you, have you heard of that low of a dose? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, what I showed you in the slides is just kind of an example to see what's out there. But there are some people who take even five to 10 milligrams once a week, and it takes them a long time. A friend of mine has been on myself from, for a year. He started off with a speck of a dose, like once every week to 10 days. Only now, after years, he's up to maybe 125 milligrams a day. And he's monstrously better. He was completely out of, out, of, out of function. And now he's functioning, he's working, he's a lot better, but he's on this teeny mini dose. It took him a whole year to get to 125 milligrams a day. So like I said, you don't push the dose. You work with the medicine, don't fight your body. Okay, I've got a question on another, on another topic. Uh, it's about... Uh, if they develop a COVID vaccine, uh, should people with uh, Lyme disease um, uh, take that vaccine? Would that be good or bad? You know, I can't answer that question now because we don't know what vaccine we're talking about. It might be a whole virus vaccine. It might be a component to the virus. It might be um, something entirely different. I've seen a lot of research on the different vaccine trials that are underway and are being proposed. And the different types of vaccines do different things to the immune system. So how they'd react to the Lyme patient depends on what kind of vaccine you're talking about. Um, in general, you wanna be cautious. Um, it's not just a vaccine, but all the COVID vaccines I'm study now have adjuvants added to it, things like aluminum and other compounds to make the vaccine more effective. But these are things that can be harmful or at least toxic to Lyme patients. So when the vaccines become available, if and when, depends on what the vaccine is made of and what these other adjuvants are. Um, you can find lists of adjuvants published, and I've seen them come across the MMI list. Um, and it's kind of surprising the kind of things that are in vaccines nowadays. So the answer to that is I can't tell you. <laughs> Sorry. That's fair enough. Very fair. Uh, let's see. Why don't we take, uh, I don't want to take this too long, maybe one last question. Um, somebody wants to know what your thoughts are on doing a water fast. You know, I asked that very same question to not one, but several of my Lyme physician friends. And a fast really does help with certain conditions, but generally does not help at least long-term with Lyme. It might suppress some of the symptoms for a while, but they end up coming back. And those physicians who I know of who have advocated this for a while are backing off from it because yes, it might have some temporary benefit, but it's not long lasting. Um, that's what I hear. I've never done it myself. I've never recommended it myself. So I have no first hand knowledge, but those who I trust and who've done it are all seeming to back away from it. Doesn't mean they don't do it anymore, but they're not getting the results that they had hoped for. Okay, very good. Uh, I think we're gonna have to cut off there. I apologize if we did not get to your question, but I wanna turn it back over to Eric to, to wrap us up. All right. I'm sorry, Eric, you're on mute. I need to unmute you. Hold on. You want to repeat what you said. Go ahead. Good. I'm unmuting. Um, you are, we can now hear you. Yes. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. So really, uh, thank you, Dr. Berscano. Just okay. want to bring this into a close. Some of the upcoming events, um, I believe everyone knows, the in-person Lyme support group meetings locally are going to be canceled until further notice. We are going to carry forward with a monthly uh, virtual Lyme Impact Series, the second Tuesday of every month, and June 9th will be our next one. Uh, Rita Rhodes, a local Lyme uh, healthcare practitioner here in Central PA, will be doing the next one. And we're trying to line up a, a couple of national speakers after that. So uh, mark your calendars for June 9th for the next Impact Series. And really in closing, thank you everyone for your support. We hope that the information was informative. We hope that you can use it for yourself, your families, your children. We appreciate your support. Please go to our website or Facebook. Donations are always welcome. And with that, we wanna thank you again and call it an evening. So thank you much. Thank you all. Bye-bye.